Please welcome Fred Perkle. Fred will be presenting on the three pillars of mineral, three pillars of mineral valuation. And <coughs> sorry, Fred, I got up here. Fred is a Bachelor of Science in Geology from Florida State University, Master in Science in Geology from the University of Florida, and a PhD in Geology from Pennsylvania State. He's a registered professional geologist in eight states and a certified <coughs> minerals appraiser by the IIMA. He began his career with Bendix and Conoco, where, there, where he conducted uranium exploration and investigations in the hydrocarbon source rocks. And he moved into a position with DuPont as their mineral sands in, at their mineral sands operations in Florida. He leads teams in exploring for titanium and zircon bearing deposits domestically and overseas. He serves as a principal geologist with Gannett Fleming in Jacksonville. His affiliations include past president of the Southeastern Geological Society and International Institute of Minerals Appraisers, the IIMA. Fred has served on the SME Mineral Valuation Standards Committee since its inception in 2012. He has been a rep for IMVAL since its inception and attended the organizational meeting in Brisbane. Please welcome Fred. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Uh, my co-author, co Bill Bagby, unfortunately, has not been able to make it today, but he has contributed uh, greatly to this presentation. Uh, first few slides will kind of be a reiteration of uh, what John just did. Uh, MVAL's International Mineral Valuation Committee. It was formed in 2012 in Brisbane, and it developed strategies for conducting mineral valuations. Again, it's principle based. Uh, again, the template is a living document. It is updated from time to time. The third edition came out uh, last year. Uh, the next one probably will not be out until you know, 2020, 2021, something like that. But We've already started thinking about what do we need in it. Uh, the template relies on the three fundamental principles that John mentioned quickly, uh, competence, materiality, and transparency. And I'm going to spend some time talking about uh, each of those. In addition, some jurisdictional areas require objectivity, independence, and reasonableness. And if I haven't run out of time, we'll talk about those a little bit. It's interesting, neither MVAL nor the International Valuation Standards require independence, which I find interesting. Uh, prior to the MVAL template, there was no common international standard uh, in existence. We had three national codes that had a lot of structure that was very similar, but they also had areas where you were in conflict with them part of what MVAL is trying to work through. You had Valman for Australia, you had Simval for Canada, and you had Simval for South Africa. Again, a lot of similarities, but a lot of differences. And as John pointed out, the template is principle-based. We're gonna give you some strategies. We're not gonna tell you how to do them. That's gonna be up to you to figure out how you wanna do the, the evaluation itself. These are just the ideas that you need to have, is all that uh, MVAL is doing. But MVAL is based on these three principles that I mentioned to you, confidence of the valuer and any experts. If you're signing the document, you're signing for that expert too. So you better know whether what he's doing. So it's <coughs> confidence, not just to the valuer, but anybody that helps the valuer on here. The materiality, to document all relative information and assumptions. Again, this will tie back into our competence as we go, and transparency of the evaluation process and the report. Remember what we're trying to do is get a reliable and relevant report that is credible. This is what we want out of this, a report that's reliable and relevant. Okay, if we talk about competence real quickly, of the valuer and any of the experts, it's not only the base knowledge that you need to be confident in. There are certain skills 
you'll have to have. One of these skills, and you'll hear this come back more than once, be able to communicate, particularly be able to write. That's a skill. You need the knowledge and experience for, to do the task at some acceptable level. But if you've done that task and you can't communicate it to your client or the other intended users in a way they understand, you failed. Relative uh, to mental evaluation, explore, explanatory, clear, logical writing is a confidence you need. And it's going to keep coming back. And that skill is different than knowledge. So when we look at using, doing something or using a, an expert, it's more than just do they have the base knowledge to do it that we need to look at. Uh, the international evaluation standards, this is how they talk about evaluations must be prepared by an individual to affirm having the appropriate technics, technical skill, experience, and knowledge of the subject of the evaluation, the market, in which it trades, and the purpose. MVAL goes a little bit further than that. MVAL comes in with this. They want the person tied to an enforceable code of ethics, uh, to an organization with an enforceable code of ethics and rules of conduct that allow that person to be disciplined and even expelled. So we, the uh, MBAO goes a little bit beyond what the IBS does in the area of confidence. Materiality, our second uh, pillar. Do document all relevant information and assumptions. It's a measure, the estimate of what effect, if I don't do this, is it going to have on my report? That's where confidence comes in to materiality. As the valuer, you are going to have to use your experience, your competence to determine, in some cases, what is material and what is not material. Materiality is judged in terms of inherent nature, impact, influence, and circumstances in which it occurs. Inval, again, has a little bit more here. It's all the information an investor would expect to find in a report so that that investor can make a reasoned and balanced judgment regarding the valuation. Now, that means I've got to have data to handle. What is it that I want to be looking at? What geologic characteristics of the subject mineral deposit are relevant? Characteristics and identity of the deposit type. Is it exhelated? Is it um, a mineral deposit that's a mineral sand deposit that's formed on a beach, formed in the dune? What type of deposit do you have? What are the characteristics that affect the development and, and beneficiation and extraction of that type of deposit? The stage of project development. John just addressed this some raw land, unpermitted prospect. That becomes very uh, material. What country is it in? Regional and local economic data concerning the development, production, and the commodity sales. Something about the market. Market into which the mineral property trades, as well as the market in which the mineral commodity trades. You'll see a lot of people doing valuations They'll say, oh, it takes so many pounds of this product to make a, go into a house, and in this place we've got a house, we got, uh, in this state we've got X thousands of houses permitted, or hundreds of thousands of houses permitted over the next two years, so sure, there's a lot of room for the commodity to go in there without realizing you are 400 miles away from where the housing boom is going to take place. General rule, you can read it, just if you admit it, omit it, or you misstate it, what effect is it going to be on your project? And this is where you start getting the competency of the value we're coming in. You're going to have to use your judgment to determine what is relevant 
and what isn't relevant. And you need data to do that in many cases. And you have to show and explain how the data are material to the evaluation. Don't just put a lot of data in there and say, oh, it's all material. You can put so much data in there, you can confuse everybody. The separation of facts from analysis and interpretation provides transparency, which we're going to go. So now we've tied, we're going to tie confidence to materiality to transparency. We're going to get all three pillars tied together. The data in their unbiased analysis leads the valuer, valuer to what? The credible opinion we're seeking. And if you don't have that rely, enough of reliable data there, you must state that in your report. You may have some data, but if it isn't enough and reliable, you've got to state that in the report. Because again, we're after a relevant, reliable report. Now, what is transparency? Oh, that's easy. It's about being easy to understand, open, frank, and honest in all communications, being accountable. Oh, being accountable. This may be just getting a little bit more concerning here. Accountability and transparency go hand in hand, involved being aware of the important pieces of information and how they can be communicated most effectively. We're gonna find out that trying to be accountable sometimes can be just the opposite of being transparent. Transparency requires the information should uh, not be presented in a minimal or unclear manner from which the intended user accepting this information at face value could draw incorrect implications. Oh, that means I have to put everything in there. I can't leave anything out because it says not to do it in a minimal or unclear manner. No. As you'll see in a minute or two, I'm gonna tell you, you can put so much stuff in there that's really irrelevant to what you need and not material to what you need that you make the person think that something's important. Just by the sheer quantity. Oh, look at this. He's got 15 pages of tables and data. Not a bit of interpretation. But you, all this, it must be important. That This must be right. A mineral value of writing skills can make the difference up here. I keep bringing writing up. Hmm, maybe that's because I'm also an adjunct professor at a college in Jacksonville, and I see what the students turn in. I don't know. Writing skills, <laughs> technical writing skills, very important. Concepts clearly understandable to me as the valuer? My client may not have a clue what I'm talking about. And I can't just say, well, that's your problem. I'm telling you what it is. You have to write it and make it clear to the client and the intended users. You can't write some highfalutin report using $30 words, turn it in and say, that's your problem if you can't understand it, it's, it's correct. You've got to be able to get your concepts across. Values must disclose all facts and figures used to create the value estimate. And you might be surprised, but Gee, try some charts and figures. It may help clarify it for your client and the intended users. Transparency also means the data you're giving them is timely, it's current, it's not 15 years old. Data management comes into this, and that's where transparency really begins. It means that data and information being managed in a manner where they are relevant and accessible to the client and are number two, timely and accurate. Relevancy is determined by the value based on what? Competency again. If you aren't confident in it, get somebody that is. It's no shame to work in a team. Get the people you need if you don't. There's not anybody that's gonna know all the mining engineering, all the mineral processing, all the economics, all the market studies on a project usually. One person's not gonna know it all. 
Accessibility to data sources means that you should, in your report, cite the sources. You can do it as a footnote, you can do it in a reference section, but let your client and the intended users know where your information came from. Timely means the value provides data information in an expeditious manner to the client and the intended users. And accuracy means you actually took the time to look at it and to the best of your knowledge, the data and information you are using and you've obtained are accurate, current, reliable, relevant, and complete. That means you may have to do some interpretation and do some looking and, and make some judgments. Back to competency again. Transparency, oh, that's, 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 I was citing some of my stuff there. Mineral valuation conclusions depend on the interaction of key assumptions and competence. All assumptions should be completely and competently identified, disclosed, and justified. Your key assumptions can apply to your data and derived information, analysis and presentation of the data and derived information. Now, in the assumptions and their interactions, they apply to the competent assessment of the mineral resource, issues pertaining to mining and financing, processing, environmental regulation, marketing not only of the mineral commodity, but also the mineral property, and the evaluation approaches and methods adopted uh, and their application. A lot of things that assumptions can apply to, and you need to let people know about those assumptions. The scope of work results uh, in the evaluation must be an accurate statement of the work performed, must be clearly stated, unambiguous. To achieve this benchmark, there must be proper investigative techniques, recording, uh, record keeping, data management, and report organization. And again, writing skills. Too much data. Oh, there can be. In general, unrelated or mineral related economic data should be minimized and should only be included when they directly affect the material economic aspects of the property. In other words, unless the appraiser demonstrates that specific economic data directly impacts the current market value of the subject property, it should be excluded. Failure to minimize irrelevant data can give the false impression that it's an accurate, that it's important. If the, if the value fails to keep irrelevant minerals related data to a minimum, but instead relies upon quotations and data compilations from economic market analysts without proper interpretation, showing relevancy to the evaluation, the sheer mass of the data creates a false impression of competency. This type of situation violates all three of our pillars. Some examples, violations can occur when a valuer communicates data analysis, opinions, and clues in a misleading manner. The market approach is used to indicate value, yet you don't tell them how uh, uh, supporting evidence as to why the mineral property or sales identified are comparable. Statement is made indicating future mineral development, but you don't talk anything about uh, funding or timing, anything of that nature. Just say, oh yeah, it's, it, there's gonna be a mine there. There's no clear explanation as to why a market into which the minerals are gonna be sold is trending up or trending down or even exists. I can have the greatest uh, mineral deposit around me, but there's no market you know, I'm not going to be able to truck it 500 miles. And there's a failure to appropriately determine the highest and best use of the mineral property. Again, something that is a very important concept. Now, we can come up, objectivity can be included, independence, reasonableness in certain jurisdictions. Again, MVAL does not override jurisdictional requirements and national requirements. Objectivity. It's just what it says, lack of bias. But MVAL 2018 defines 
It's, the, it's promoted by an environment that is supported by data and minimizes the influence of subjective factors such as the valuer's personal bias on the valuation process. In accounting, there is this objectivity principle. Whenever possible, put real numbers in. Hard numbers in. We do estimates and opinions of value. So we do not want to get confused when with what's happening here. This statement is geared toward accounting where actual purchase or sale prices, prices, not value estimates, are entered into the financial statements. There are data that must be interpreted in our valuations. Again, competency. And turn those data information to relevant material for the property. So you should not accuse objectivity, should not confuse objectivity when performing minimum valuations with the objective, with objectivity principle of accounting. They are different. Invalid defines objectivity as acting impartially and without bias in preparing valuation reports. The valuer should let the data and its derived information direct the path of the value opinion. That path should not lead to a preconceived value. The valuation process and revolt, resulting opinions, as documented in the report, should be supported by data that's material. It's derived information and, can, and should be transparent. Independence, the quality of state of not being under control or reliant on somebody else, Evaluators have no interest in the commissioning entity, the mineral property, the valuation outcome other than professional fees and disbursements, and his fee should not or her fee should not be contingent on the opinion of the valuation. Neither the Inval template nor IVSC, the International Valuation Standards Committee, requires independence of the valuer, but you should always make a statement in your report as to whether there is or is not independence. Uh, Corp Law blog gave a list of things that can trip you up on independence, such as the self-interest threat, the familiarity threat. You so you know the client so well, you take their word for everything. Self-review threat, trust threat, intimidation threat, and the advocacy threat. You actually become an advocate. In it. You should not be an advocate when you're doing your valuations. Reasonableness. It's more of a consensus of in, of, than anything else among a substantial number of people. The value must ensure reasonableness of the valuation. A method applied to the subject matter should be within the expected capability and consideration of an assumed likely buyer or leasee of the property. In other words, we get around and we, get a, a, we have a valuation. If I gave five other valuers, or five other valuers acquired the same data, the same, and used the same effective date that was there, and the property was in the same state that it was uh, when you did it, they should come up with values that are similar, that are reasonable. They should look at your value and say, yes, that is a reasonable value to have. Now, this is, this is just another way of saying what I just, ultimately a value must have confidence that the resulting opinion of the value makes sense. And these three pillars of trust become the backbone of ensuring public trust, which is what we're really all about. An organization's professional code of ethics, or code of conduct, or code of ethics, is used to enforce these principles. Remember, M. Val said you can kick the person, the organization can kick the person out or discipline the person if they aren't doing what they're supposed to. That helps ensure the public trust. And prominent public display of these principles and codes in an organization's documents provides the public with a foundation for trust and minimal valuations. Now we get to accountability. 
the professional that signs it is accountable for failure to comply with ethical principles and conduct. Such accountability may be a self-regulatory body as a mental value organization, another professional organization, or a government uh, body. You've got to, again, have this system, and it should be easy if somebody wants to file a complaint. It should be easy for them to be able to get to the, to the uh, right organization and right way to uh, file a complaint if they want to. It should be posted on that organization's website how you do it. And with that, thank you very much. Any questions?